this is sort of the whirlwind tour of the history of AI. And now, of course, technically, 2011 is still seven, eight years ago. But whatever happened after this, I'm going to call present. You know, this, I am just going to call it present because if otherwise, if I have to just talk about present for the present moment in time, it's very hard for me to say something. But there were interesting new developments that happened after 2011 that caused the AI as a field to change. Now we have, as we have talked about history, we have talked about applications, but we have not talked about technology. And if you go back to the technology, what happened is that initially there was a lot of work on search, right? How do I get to the goal? And around that time, you know, people were working on neural networks also as a representation for uh, representing functions. And then neural networks went through bad periods twice because once it went through bad periods where uh, somebody proved that you can't even represent an XOR function using a perceptron, which we will talk about much later. And so it went out of business. Later it came back in business and people started using neural networks for uh, applications. But then one person will say, I have used a neural network for driving straight. The second person will try to replicate it, will not be able to replicate it. And the reason is that there was a lot of black magic and black art going on in training a neural network, which was very hard to reproduce at the time. Uh, and it's still not very easy today. So neural networks again went through a, a, ba a bad phase where people said, no, 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 if you are doing neural networks, you are this old style researcher who has not moved on. The newest cool thing is probability. But in the middle, for the la longest time, for almost 20, 30 years, it was a time of logic. So literally search, neural networks, logic, neural networks, probability, and today, neural networks. Now, this is not exactly a you know, straight timeline. Things are happening in parallel, but you sort of get the gist. So the first generation of AI, in my opinion, it would, we would call it logic-based AI, symbolic AI, AI search AI, those things where you have you know, combinatorial algorithms and so on. Second phase of AI, we will say, is probabilistic AI, right? This happened, and a person got Turing Award for this. Do you know who? Yudia Pearl. Yudia Pearl is a professor at UCLA who ended up getting a Turing Award for his work on probabilistic models, okay? Bayesian networks comes from his work, for example. And so in the late, from late 90s to uh, very early 2010, we, we can easily call it the era of the probabilistic AI. At this time, neural was again a bad word, okay? And now from the last six, seven years, neural models have completely overtaken and overshadowed everything else again, okay? And so one of the most prominent demonstrations in AI that happened in that genre was the AlphaGo competition, okay? Or AlphaGo is the name of the Go player. So once chess was done, and chess, uh, we, we, nobody competed against machines for chess. All the game people were saying, okay, what's the next problem we should solve? What's the next game we should work on? And the next game was the game of Go, which is supposedly much, much harder than the game of chess. Like the game of chess has eight cross eight board. The game of Go has 19 cross 19 board and many other complications. We did not believe that we are ready to defeat humans in the game of Go. Even until 2015, we did not believe it. Only when suddenly we saw that this bunch of, you know, a handful of researchers in England have defeated, no, ha, no, no, they, okay, sorry. So they, they had a startup called DeepMind, okay? And I think in 2014 or 15, DeepMind was bought by Google, technically Alphabet, so the parent company of Google. So technically DeepMind is not Google's thing, it's a Google system. So Google acquired DeepMind for $500 million and nobody knew why. Because they didn't say anything what their technology is and there were just a few researchers in that group and only one or two of those researchers were really well known. One of the most well known person in that group was David Silver who had also defeated human in 9 cross 9 go earlier. But 9 cross 9 and 19 cross 19 are just two different worlds, right? 9 cross 9 is babies go and 19 cross 19 is just too difficult. So we were very surprised as to why this acquisition has happened. And we got to know it very quickly that this is because they had one of the earliest really high quality deep learning technology neural models which was specialized for the specific sub-area of reinforcement learning. 
which they implied in the context of the Go game. And so they wrote a series of papers which were, became nature papers and uh, but the most biggest, the biggest contribution or the success was uh, AlphaGo defeating uh, the Roger Federer of Go, Lee Sidol, right? So Go is an oriental game. Most of the champions come from China and Korea and uh, Japan and so Lee Sidol came I believe from Korea and uh, he was defeated 4-1. So he, he sort of lost, started losing very quickly. He really thought about it and he came back with a new strategy. He won one game. But then in the next game, the Go player, Alpha Go, made a mistake. But when I say a mistake, it's a quote unquote mistake. Because all the experts of the game said it's a mistake. But Go player was very confident. Now, David Silver or DeepMind people didn't know why the Go player is playing what it is playing. It is doing its search, it is doing its playing, right? But eventually, people found out that what they were thinking as the mistake was actually a new insight that the Go player, automatic Go player had learned, AlphaGo had learned, but humans didn't even know it. And so Lee Sidol who thought that he has won the game because the Go player has made this mistake, basically ended up losing the game. It's pretty amazing stuff. And all this game was shown on TV and so on. So you know, you can go and check out the videos, right? This happened just two years, three years ago. This happened in uh, very recently when I was in IIT. And moreover, uh, another very interesting thing that DeepMind showed is that if you know there was something called Atari games, when we were kids, Atari games were the only games we, we could play, kind of Mario and... Um, Pinball and boxing and all of that. Is Mario really in this? Pac-Man at least, right? I don't know if Mario shows up here. But uh, they have one algorithm, single algorithm based on deep neural networks, which learns playing each game, specializes itself for each game, and then uh, plays it really well. And the line here, the, the big line, is the human performance. And uh, this is sort of any game above this line is sort of superhuman performance and anything uh, below this line is sort of subhuman performance, right? So this is the line and um, for many of these games a single algorithm was able to beat human performance. So what has changed? How suddenly are we starting to see all these kinds of successes? And uh, in fact, uh, there are more. So this is the number of transcripts mentioning artificial intelligence. And as you can see, suddenly, you know, there were a few, there were a few, there were a few, and suddenly there are a lot. What has changed? What has changed is that three roads which were happening in parallel have suddenly come together. One of the road is the road of algorithms. But notice that the algorithms often were developed in the 90s, the ones that we are using today. We have innovated some on the algorithms. I would not say we have not innovated. But the fundamental algorithms actually came much earlier. But why did they not succeed then? They did not succeed then because they didn't have enough compute power or enough data to train on. And these two roads are incredibly important in the modern AI. We can call it data-driven AI, compute-hungry AI. AI where somebody creates a large data set, the hardware architecture guys give you the processors. Sometimes, sometimes people tell me that some companies burn even hundred thousand dollars, million dollars per month on just compute. Compute has become extremely important commodity in today's world. And then these algorithms are employed on this data, trained on this compute to create really amazing results. And what are these amazing results? One such amazing result, and this is the first amazing result that happened, is in the field of object recognition, computer vision where the goal is to figure out for a given image which object is in that image, right? And this is a long-standing problem. And people had been developing lots of algorithms for it for a very, very long time. And their error rate was about 25%. This Alex person, who was a student of Jeffrey Hinton, you, you must know about Jeff Hinton. He got the Turing Award this year. So Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, and Joshua Bengio are the three sort of quote-unquote fathers of deep learning today. 
and they all got uh, a Turing Award because of the deep learning revolution and AI revolution that has caused. This, uh, the, the, the Alex at University of Toronto used neural networks on this task, trained on these super fast machines, these GPUs from NVIDIA, and got the error rate down to 16% in one year. From 25% to 16% was such a huge deal that everybody started to take notice of it. They didn't know what happened. How did it suddenly get from 25 to 16? They were not able to make progress. And in the next few years, it went down to 3% and 2%. And now it is said that at least on this data set, neural networks can beat humans on, uh, by using neural networks. Now, it is very interesting to look at some of the history of Jeff Hinton. I told you that neural became a bad word even within the field of AI because neural network went through these phases where, for example, in the last phase, people thought that, you know, only the older style people do neural network research. It's not modern enough. Everything should be Bayesian, probabilistic, and so on. To the extent that, do you know what is the full form of NIPS or NURIPS? Neural Information Processing Systems. Neural is part of the name of the conference. And in 2000s, if you had a paper with the word neural in it, there was a high chance it will be rejected from NIPS. In that time, there were very few people who kept doing this kind of research. Even though it was not mainstream, even though people laughed at them, even though their papers were not getting published, they kept doing this research. And one such luminary is Jeff Hinton. He went through this whole phase of nobody, quote-unquote, respecting him because he's still doing, quote-unquote, what he was doing 20 years ago, and everybody else thought that the field has moved on. You have not moved on. You should move on, too. You are stuck in time. But he kept working in it because he had the conviction that he, this particular technology can lead to success. People thought he may have been crazy. He thought he knew the answer. And there are many such people. Often they, they are wrong. But then there are exceptions, and Jeff Hinton ended up being one of those exceptions. So finally, he had the last laugh, of course. But it takes a lot of guts and a lot of courage of heart to pursue something which the rest of the world is saying is meaningless today. Right? Think about that. Um, and there were others, of course. right? Uh, now, what kind of novel applications started happening? These are style transfer applications. For example, if I give you two of these images, right, uh, and I ask the machine to produce a third image using style of this and content of this, the machine can produce this. Pretty amazing stuff. If you give this doodle, this I can draw, it will create a painting which I can't draw. If you give a black and white image, the machine may color it for you. Now we can color Mughal Azam much more easily. You know, earlier they painstakingly colored. You know, I was talking to somebody who does this work for a living, and he told me that the softwares are becoming better and better and better, and he only needs to just make sure that the software is doing the right thing as opposed to doing a lot of manual work himself. Pretty amazing. The fact that vision and text started coming together successfully was a revelation. Now you give it an image, and the machine can give you a caption, right? A motorcycle, a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, a group of young people playing a game of frisbee, pretty amazing stuff. Of course, it is not always correct. Uh, uh, it says that a little girl in pink hat is blowing bubbles, which is wrong, and uh, uh, two dogs playing in the grass, which is three, and there are many other funny mistakes that it does. But the fact that we can do anything is a huge deal, believe it or not. The same happened in automatic speech recognition, where for the longest time in, on some data sets, our accuracy was stuck at 70%. And now suddenly in the last few years, the accuracy has gone up to 95% and over time has beaten the human performance, at least on these data sets. I'm not saying these are solved problems. I'm not saying vision is a solved problem. I'm not sp saying speech recognition is a solved problem. But the amount of progress, almost exponential progress that we have made in the last few years has really made AI a central theme in a lot of common discourse. In fact, we have gone from, if it works, it's not AI. Two, everything is AI. It's all AI. If your bottle can keep the water warm and hot, it must be an intelligent bottle. 
In fact, there was a study done and they found that 40% of AI startups in Europe, AI startups in Europe don't use any AI. But if they use the word AI, they get funding. Hint, hint. I know many of you want to start startups after you finish college. Do fundamental networking work and call it AI. No, but this is really true because there's a lot of funding in AI. In fact, there's a very funny quote which says, if you want funding, call it AI. If you want to hire somebody, call it machine learning and then do data science. That's somewhat pejorative for many fields, but we'll have fun with this. Okay, so we have reached a point where in common discourse people are saying killer robots will enslave humans. Now we have gone back full circle from the point that AI can claim but not deliver anything, therefore it's good for nothing, to a point that some successes happened and then they, they took it to the next extreme and said AI will become so powerful that it is going to kill us. Right, so there is no nothing in the middle. Okay, AI is working, it will be helpful to the humans. Nah, too boring as a discourse. Let us say AI is terrible, useless, too, AI is going to kill us. And it's super powerful. Right? Okay. So this is where we are. Uh, sex robots could murder people, right? <laughs> AI, uh, somebody wrote this very interesting article saying, tomorrow you will become all powerful, you will want to kill all humans. Before you kill all humans, my article written ages ago is on the website. Please read it and see why you should not kill humans. People like Elon Musk who use AI left, right and center in their cars say that AI can doom human civilization. I wonder why. Of course, other people have a sane voice. They say Elon Musk is obviously wrong. AI singularity is not going to kill us. And then 50 Nobel laureates say that AI is not a major threat. Uh, there are many other important threats like climate, pollution, nuclear war and you can read the rest. Now while this whole discourse of uh, is AI going to kill us or not is completely meaningless because I don't believe it is going to at all and we can discuss why later. The fact that some jobs are going to be displaced is actually a real, real thing. Robots may take over jobs, some jobs. For example, taxi, uh, not taxi but truck drivers in the US may not have a job 20 years from now because self-driving uh, trucks may become significant enough and truck driving is a painful job because you are staying up over through long nights, right, driving long distances in a complicated vehicle. Um, then there are articles which say many jobs are safe from AI. One article says it will eliminate millions of jobs. Another article says it will clear, create more jobs than it eliminates. Basically what is very clear is that AI is going to create new and unconventional career paths. Okay? And so it is important to study the field to understand what it is able to do what it is not able to do, to be much better prepared. And so this is my last slide. I just want to tell you that AI hasn't been solved yet. I mean, I, I, I hope you understand that, you know, there's a lot of progress, but that doesn't mean much. And so there was this RoboCup as a competition where you want to make a team of robots which can defeat Brazil in the game of soccer, or football as we call it, or Germany, right? It doesn't have to be Brazil only. And let us see where it is today. This is a field where robots and AI has to come together and uh, let us see how uh, well we are doing. So this is the current state of soccer, robot soccer today. Now RoboCup is an amazing competition because whatever technology they develop, they try their best to release it so that other people can use it so that every year they make progress as a community. But look at this robot and how, <laughs> how ready it is to defeat humans. This is a league where they practice, <laughs> sorry, this league is a league where they practice a strategy because the robots have lim uh, are easier to manage. The fact that it can stand up is actually an amazing feat. It's not very easy. Notice how important the goalkeeper is here. <laughs> how actively it is trying to avoid any goal. You know, it is so difficult just to know where you are in the field. Where is the ball? And that's a goal. No, no, no. Now it's a goal. <laughs> and so uh, the point is that there is a lot of work to be done. There are some things that AI has started to do well. There are a lot of buzz and excitement about it. But as the course progresses, we will see what 
it will not also be able to do. Let's stop here. Then tomorrow, uh, in the next class, we will start talking about what is AI, what really is AI, and the philosophy of AI. So that will be the next topic. Thank you.